know, we were we kind of grew up pretty poor, so we couldn't afford actually a piano or any instrument. And we went to the conservatorium uh, in Tel Aviv, and it, um, the only instrument they had that they would kind of lend you while you were studying would be a trombone. Mm. I ended up actually um, studying trombone and arrangement for a big band for like uh, two or three years. Uh, that was around, yeah, when I was around 11, 12. Um, and that, that was my instrument, the, my main instrument for a while. And then, then we went to, um, to like visit relatives in Germany at some point, uh, when I was around, uh, 13, I think something like that. And we went on a tour to Bavaria studio where they were doing the, the never ending story at the time. And, uh, from here to there, I kind of I met Klaus Dullinger and I got to see a session of the of, of the you know recording the score for it uh, in Bavaria, and that that I think somehow kind of was the first seed of like oh you know I love movies and I love music and that's something that you can kind of uh, marinate it together you know and and that could be something really cool to do, but it was still not like top of it was more I think a subconscious thing. Because mm -hmm. I was more interested in, in, in music than I was in movies. Um, and I just went through being, you know, in rock bands and electronic bands and uh, going on tour for my teens and uh, working as a T-boy in a studio, uh, learning how to record and mix and things like that. Um, and I and uh, but and I would write like all these kind of instrumental music, but my first kind of gig was actually working in theater. So I started writing music for theater, funny enough. And that was through my late teens. And through that, I, uh, I got an offer to work as a programmer and do some kind of additional arrangement for a TV series uh, that was called The Chancer with Clive Owen. Um, and... I think, you know, Jan would send stuff over and, you know, I would reprogram based on the same synths that he had and all these kind of stuff. And I think that kind of, uh, kind of drew me in. And then from that, something else happened. And before you know it, I was scoring movies basically, but it was never kind of like, Oh, I want to, you know, be a film composer. Mm -hmm. I like instrumental music, but I always saw myself more as a, as a rock musician and going on tour and hanging out with ladies and all that kind of stuff more than I would, you know, sit in the studio by myself, but it, it kind of took over and, and, you know, that was kind of a natural way to go into it. But, um, and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I think my, my first, first score was like in the, I think it was the late eighties, um, late eighties or something like that. And it was still, you know, I met, I met some composer who were, you know, kind of great mentors and gave me loads of advice like Earl Hagen and, and, and you Morricone and, and, um, uh, 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 Gerald Fried and stuff like that. And, you know, Earl, Earl Hagen gave me a click book. So I was very lucky to, to start when I did, because I managed to go through, you know, um, working old school in a way you know i had click books as film were still done on 35 millimeters mm. um there was no there was no you know barely any software at the time a lot of it was kind of like done by hand you know at least for the orchestration um so it was it was a very good learning you know it was streamers punches so i'm very used to work like that um where now obviously it's all digital and stuff but yeah. uh but that was kind of like my upbringing into doing film scores, basically. How did the opportunity of Ghost Stories come your way? And what was the process like collaborating with both Jeremy and Andy on the film? Ghost Stories came about, funny enough, uh, I did a movie that was, uh, that was very successful and, and kind of opened a lot of doors, both for me, for the directors. Um, so a lot of people were involved, called Big Bad Wolves. Um, it gave me a big award in LA, the Saturn Award, you know. Um, so it opened a lot of doors, and we had a we had a very big premiere in London for the movie. And uh, funny enough, um, Andy Neyman, who's one of the directors, uh, was at the premiere, same premiere. And uh, he got in touch with me. I think it was a couple of weeks after, and uh, you know, asked if I want to meet up, uh, have a coffee or something, and. Um, 
you know, we met up, we got, we, you know, we got along very well. Um, and I think it was, I think it was like a month after or so they, they did another run of the original ghost stories play at the West end. So he said, you know, we're running our play. Uh, I'm going to have a, I'm going to see it. Uh, do you want to come and see the play as well? So I said, great. Went and saw the play that left quite a big impression because it, it wasn't your like, you know, um, ordinary scary play it was done very it was very sophisticated how it was done there was no music there's no score in the play um there were the source songs that we have in the movie but there was no there wasn't any um any score but they had quite a sophisticated way of going about the sound design and and working with the with the lights to create this kind of really creepy um scary atmosphere and you know it, it stroke a really like you know like uh, you live you leave the theater and you go wow that's that's something new um, and then you know we we were after the play we we just went for a drink and we had a discussion and he says you know that they are thinking of turning the, the play into a movie and would I be interested in writing the music and I said yeah you know I love the play so great. Yeah, they sent they sent me the script to read, and they sent me um, like uh, I'm not sure if to call it proof of concept, but it was like how the film should look like, what's the characters, how the characters would look like if it's like storyboards and and images, um, and then you know to come up with um, some ideas like musical ideas for the meeting. Um, went in, gave them my ideas based on on the script and what we, you know, they sent me stuff. And, um, you know, they love what I was thinking to do musically. Um, and, you know, there was straight from day one, it was very obvious that they wanted a score that um, A, is going to be very melodic. Um, it's going to be, you know, haunting in one way, melodic. Um, it had to reflect some sort of, some sort of, uh, um, melancholic feel for the main character um and yet menacing and then obviously you have the scary parts in the movie that needs to be scary but we wanted to do um we both all agreed that it had to be a very kind of um very old school orchestral score you know but not your average um uh horror you know horror score you know um and also usually when i score horrors it's um you know, I, I always try to do them kind of more psychological and more melodic if I can than just, you know, put some uh, effect techniques and, and stuff like that. You know, I try to, I think somebody said that I, do, I, I my style of horror is like elegant horror, mm. which, <laughs> which I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but it's, you know, it's that kind of like my style of horror music. No, I think uh, I think that actually that whole elegant horror aspect has, has really given rise in the past few years with composers like yourself and and Wallfish, of course, with stuff like Annabelle Creation, where beforehand you had all the Joseph Bashara as sound design, and but then you had this sort of soaring orchestral score, and that's the thing that I love about Ghost Stories. And I'm curious whether the Allerton Suite on the soundtrack is one is one of those first tracks that you wrote, um, because it tends to have that sound that the whole entire score sort of encompasses. So can you tell the story of that specific suite or that theme? That was actually the first, uh, um, yeah, that, that was the first thing, um, that, that was the first thing I wrote. Um, the way we went about it, I mean, we, I got involved with Ghost Stories about, um, I think it was two months or so prior to shooting. So I wrote, um, uh, we had chat like, how are we going to go about the score and how are we going to do it? And um, I mean, I usually work chronologically so I work from one and one and I go up but I always um, I always write my themes or I write I write suites uh, prior to the to actually sitting down and start to work with the image because um, it gives you a much better base I think um, you know with your arsenal of what you have your palette of, of sounds and colors and um, there's things you do discover as you go along obviously through the movie but um, I but here we wanted to to have music that we can a they can maybe play it on set to the actors to set the scene sometimes and uh we wanted you know and the idea was to progress with the writing 
as based like almost hand in hand when they progress with the score uh, with the with the filming and the editing because they were editing while they were filming um and one of the main thing was uh was to find uh goodman's theme because he's the main character so our discussion was all right so we have goodman's who's the main character um and then we have the three different cases so you know and then you have like obviously that the kind of ghost stories the movie so mm-hmm. do we create a theme for the movie or to create you know a theme and then each each character gets their theme or you know it, it, there's a lot of possibilities but it also can be very confusing um so i thought because all of it is actually built around goodman that the, the best thing would be to have one major theme which is goodman's theme mm-hmm. and then we'll have separate themes and and kind of musical idents for each of the cases because when we when we go into the cases themselves we don't um goodman is not there it's just the character telling the story and then we dive into a whole new world of, of what happening um yeah there's like so, there's tons of really interesting thematic material i think one of the highlights for me actually was maria's theme like that mm. you know it has the flute uh, it's a really beautiful theme and then there's like this track called corridor of truth uh, and it has yeah. this really cool but creepy atmospheric operatic voice. Um, yeah. So that's the thing that I love about it is that it does have this thread that sort of ties through it being Goodman's theme. It's also the ending credits, but it has all of these really interesting sort of takes on that theme and sort of going in different directions, but keeping in the same sonic world. You know, we knew that we we're going to have an opening titles, proper opening titles for the movie, um, which is basically it's a, I think it's like a 16 mil film of Goodman as a kid in his bar mitzvah kind of a thing and then it shows a bit of his relationship with his father and to and why um you know and gives us kind of like a glimpse in his background um so we knew that it had to be something that has to be a bit of uh, I would say sadness yet some sort of a menacing feel to it so the film had to reflect both the sadness in his in his past and and that kind of sense of uh, foreboding or something that was wrong going there. Um, so that was the and then obviously there is this kind of Jewish heritage that kind of close circle at some point, but we didn't want to we didn't want to create um, you know something that will be too Jewish, say with a clarinet or a violin or something like that. Um, so it was more about finding that kind of melody essence that will give you that kind of Jewish feel to it. Because that's there is a bit of that kind of reoccurrence later on, which kind of explained to us certain things in the movie. Um, so that was the hard thing. That was the, the hardest theme to find. But once we have that, and then I, I wrote the rest of the themes, those kind of suites, um, and um, what what I did is basically I once I had all the suites and we all agreed okay Maria's theme Priddle theme um, each of the character has their theme and ident. Um, what I did I I just deconstructed everything through the movie. So there's you know there's hints from Goodman's theme into into some of the other um, in into the other the other themes and then the other themes can interact with Goodman's theme. So it's almost like a small clues where everything kind of close together towards the end, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a, a different way of kind of working on a score. It's where you have everything ready and then you just take it apart and start. It's almost like building, re, rebuilding a puzzle, you know, to bring like a different piece, a different picture of that puzzle. Um, and then the corridor through, for instance. So that's, yeah, that, that's, you know, again, that's that's kind of going from, some sort of a weird, a weird transition of scary into this kind of reality sadness, into that kind of big climax of what of what he's discovers, and then you have this kind of weird variation on the theme, sang by an opera singer, for instance, instead of the choir and everything. But you so you have that kind of shrieking kind of opera singer cutting through everything almost, even as much as the orchestra is big and playing there, she still kind of cut through. And um, it's almost like a, a you know, um, 
somebody slicing the air and, and you kind of, you know, you don't know what's going on, but it's like there's something very clear all of a sudden because that's something he discovers in that scene, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, and Maria's theme, for instance, Maria's theme, um, there's, um, there's two elements from that theme itself that's actually in the movie, but the suite itself is only for the soundtrack. So we, when we went to record the orchestra and everything, um, we we took the original themes that were made for the, the the original suites that were made as 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 the I would say as the starting point for the movie, and we record them especially for the album. So some of them are in the movie, but they're in pieces, and then some of them are a bit different. But the original suites, they're all, for instance, are on the album, so they were recorded especially for the album. So. Uh, and Goodman's theme, the the one with the violin, which is the end titles. Um, then we decided, you know, to to really make it that kind of, to give it that kind of real Jewish um, aspect to it. So we did a solo violin and with the whole, you know, featuring the violin with the orchestra. But it was also to give like the audience when they leave the cinema something to think about, you know. So it's almost like a closure where all these pieces are in that small piece, basically. Can you describe your process of what it's like going in on the first day, the sheet music's on the stands, what it's like to get started, get the ball rolling, and how that process of actually recording the score sort of is? Well, I worked, I worked with the, I worked with the LMO, like I think on, on five or six movies that we've done. I think actually all of them, besides one that was done at Abbey Road, um, all of them were done at air. There's something very special with the, with how the whole resonate, um, which is, you know, it's a different sound to, to every road. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love, I love, you know, air is, uh, I've done, I think all my movies there and it's like a family. So, um, I was actually based, I was based there for a month writing in one of the rooms upstairs, you know, in the, the tower, funny enough. Um, we were just there, you know, uh, right. So I did the majority of writing somewhere else. And then, um, once they had the film edited, um, we were just based there for a month doing everything. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, I mean, every time you go and record an orchestra, it's, it's, it's just an amazing feeling because, um, you know, my mock-ups are quite detailed, you know, I don't spend a lot of time programming and, and doing stuff. I just, I play stuff straight in, um, and more or less kind of how, I guess, how a player would do it. And then I would sit with my orchestrator and, um, in Sibelius and we go over certain things that we can add that you can't do with samples. Uh, and then I would say, okay, can we do some effects here? So let's do these effects. Okay. Or so we decide of what we want to record and, you know, the order and everything. Um, and then, you know, we, we kind of, usually you set up the, the sessions, uh, you set up the room a night before. So, you know, I was, uh, cause I was there, I always pop in and see, you know, how they set up and how it looks. And we, you know, me and Casey Stone, my engineer, we go over what we're going to record and uh, we do a prep for the sessions uh, on Pro Tools. Um, but it's always, you know, when you go in and the musician starts, uh, you know, the musician starts to come in and stuff. Um, I, I, I think I've been doing it since day one. I always, uh, I always, you know, I'm not hiding in the control or anything, but I always greet the musicians when they come and I chat to them. Most of them I know anyway. Um, and then, you know, we do a few rehearsals, but it's always that kind of, you know, you always this, you have this kind of butterflies in your stomach and that excitement of like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, um, I wouldn't say it's, ten- it's, it's very tense. I mean, you have to be very concentrated and, and then, you know, it's very kind of could be very stressful, but I've, I've been never a big believer in, you know, that session need to be stressful and and people shouting and stuff so everybody usually are very laid back and and it's just a great feeling you know when they start you know when when you do the the first recording you know or you do the first run and you do your your kind of sound balance it's the most amazing uh, experience that you can have that you know you got 60 70 doesn't matter how many players sitting there playing something that you were two days ago you were locked in a room writing it on the computer um, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like Frankenstein, you breathe life into it and you go, it's alive, it's alive, you know, yeah. it's still amazing. It's amazing. And I'm sure that sensation hasn't gone away each score that you've done each time that first pass, it's just a magical thing, right? 
I think if that feeling kind of goes away, then you might as well do something else yeah. in life. Yeah. Um, never, never. It's the most amazing thing. And no matter how stressful it is and, you know, and if there's, there's, you know, technical issues or whatnot, it's every time they start playing, you're like, it's, it's, it's magic. So when you, when you sit down at the premiere, the film has been edited, the film's been scored, the film's been dubbed, you're with the directors and the producers, and it's the final screening of the film. What is that viewing process like? Are you taking in the film as a whole? Are you paying attention to the music? How are you sort of reacting to the film in real time? I mean, usually when you get to the premiere, um, by then you, you know, usually... I think you've seen the movie like a hundred times through test screenings with the audience and your uh, mock-up score. Um, or, you know, you've been already to a few uh, screenings one, once it was finished. Um, you know, like in Ghost Stories, for instance, I was asked to be at the dubbing stage. Usually you don't get to go to the dubbing. You might pop in to visit. Uh, but usually they prefer that the composer will not show up at the dub. But here, you know, I had a very great rapport with uh, Jeremy and Andy, and I actually was, I was two weeks every day at the, the mixing stage. Um, and in the premiere, usually, yeah, it's, it's you know, you on one side you absorb how it is, but I always kind of, you know, I always kind of pay attention more to see how the audience react to it. Um, you know, like I know where the jump scares are or, or you know, certain certain scenes that I'm sometimes more interested now to see how it affects the audience, you know, when we have the final product, you know, and, but there, there's still, you know, like there's still scenes I would sit there and, and I would get the goosebumps cause I know it's working, you know, and for me, that's always the indication, even when I record it or when I work with it, you always get that few scenes where you know you get these kind of goosebumps and you know that scene works yeah if it's jump scares or something i know where they are so you're more interested to see how the audience react to it you know yeah and you, you sit there with your musical crew and everybody and we all kind of look at one another because we know that's coming and you're more interested in how this but yeah the goosebumps are always there when it when the scenes work then you, you feel it so since this is for the global composers network i wanted to ask you what is one or two uh, pieces of advice um, that somebody when you were younger told you that has stuck with you for a long time um, and sort of helped you along your musical journey? I think the best advice I've, I've, I've had was that, you know, stay, stay kind of true to yourself. Um, you know, trust the instinct. You know, if, um, if something, if you feel something is not working, then it, it, it will not work, you know. Um, if you think it's working, it will work. Um, but that, yeah, that would say is like the best thing when you do something and you think, I'm not sure if it's working, but I've noticed that like if I do something and um, it's, you know, it doesn't feel super right. And I think, well, I'll give it and see if the directors like it, great. But usually if I feel it doesn't work or it's not there, that's more or less how they will, they, I found out they are reacting the same thing. They go, yeah, we like it, but it's not there or, you know, or usually it's what else do you got? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and another thing I would say is, is um, don't try and be somebody else. You know, there is already John Williams and Hans Zimmer. There is, uh, you know, Thomas Newman. There's Alan Silvestri. There's, you know, and if you listen to these guys, they they all have their their sound and voice. Um, so I think for me, it was always important to try and find. Um, you know, my voice. Um, I mean, I, I'm self-taught. I didn't go for any kind of music college or I didn't study composition or orchestration or things like that. I've done it all myself through books and, and through work. Um, but it's, you know, it's, I think the most important thing is to, to, to try and find your own voice. Cause I think when you have your voice, you know, and your techniques, that kind of sometimes separates you from the rest. You know, um, because it's it's more, you know, each film has a character, but it, but when a when a director wants you, it's because they feel that your your voice or your character is the one that will go best, you know, with their movie. And I think you know, um, I think it's great to inspire to be like John Williams or Hans Zimmer or anybody of the greats, but it's it's great to to be inspired by them as to get to the level of how they work and such but not to sound like you know 
Because sound like nobody wants a sound like, you know, people prefer somebody who's original. If somebody wants John Williams, they'll go and try and get John Williams. Um, and um, and the rest is just, you know, it's just dedication, you know, it's, and keep on writing every day. It doesn't matter what you write for, if it's good or bad. The more you write, the more you, um, I think you're going to establish your voice. And I think you, um, uh, you know, you're going to get better at writing, you know. I mean, I, I always, like, every time I get a, uh, to do a movie, I kind of dread, you know, the, you know, to the few, the first few notes that you have to start writing and make the theme, that's the one you always dread. It's great to get the job, and uh, you know, talk about it, and you go, yeah, I've got all these ideas, da 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 da. But you know, sitting at the piano, and then you go, okay, now I need to write a theme. That's the hard part. It's like, <laughs> okay, what can I, what can I write? What will give me that? You know, that's the always, that's the hard part. Uh, and the rest, you know, once you have that, you know, the rest will come, and before you know it, you've got loads of credits and. You know, um, you know, I, I always have chat with like uh, fellow composers and stuff, and I always find that there's like three there's like three rules almost that everybody almost go by, and um, usually it's one is like uh, it's you know money, so it's if you get a fee for your work, and you know it's making a living, so it's about that, and you're happy with that, then that's fine. Uh, the second is usually a music budget, so you get a proper or a decent music budget um, to record musicians um, or an orchestra or, you know, um, anything basically that will get your score to sound properly done, um, even if your fee is not the best or anything. And the third is credit. So, you know, there's always a big debate about if you, um, you know, not to do anything for free. You know, um, there's a big debate, you know, never do uh, anything for free. Always have something, you know, always if somebody says, oh, do you want to do this movie? Uh, but we don't have any budget or there's no fee. Would you do it for free? You know, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that, you know, it's I think there's always even if you do something for free, you can learn from it. You know, um, I don't I don't think you need to do anything for free or anything like this, but Sometimes you can, you know, it, if somebody comes with a project that's like very interesting and you think, okay, it has so-and-so actors, you know, which are, you know, known and great and the editor is great and, you know, there's people with names and this and, you know, they ran out of money or they spent it on another composer and it didn't work out, you know, then I think it's worth doing it for free because I think something like that, it gives you a, a decent credit. You're working with decent people who knows what they're doing so that will push you to another level, you know. Um, so I think if, you know, choosing the, the, the right project, even if you do it for free, I think it's good. But that kind of taught me a lot, you know, how to work and how to do certain things and, and put, you know, knowledge that I kind of read and, and, you know, chatted about with people, put it into practice. Because if I, if I would say, no, I want to get paid, they would say, okay, I'll go, we're going for somebody else. I would miss my, and that was like, you know, it's like paying, like paying for university, you know what I mean? So, you know, I've done it for free, but, you know, that kind of taught me and, you know, and you, the, the best way to learn is usually through doing, basically. So I'd rather, I rather say, okay, I'd rather be doing something, even, even if I don't get paid, but at least I'm sitting and writing and that's going to bring me somewhere than just sit at home saying, no, I'm going to wait for a paying gig. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that paying gig could be just doing some, you know, dingy music that's, you know, will not teach you anything or, or will advance your process in any way. So, so if you, okay, so you got money, but then what, you know? Um, so I think, you know, obviously it's choosing the right project, but I think it's as long as you write and you get to write good stuff, then that's what's going to bring it. So, um, yeah, I don't believe in just sit and wait for, you know, paying gig because, I think, you know, you can sit a long time and wait for it, you know. I'd rather be doing than just sitting and waiting. Yeah. I truly do look forward to your future projects because um, after listening to stuff like Big Bad Wolves with the Hitchcockian feel and Abuele was really, really beautiful, sort of your classic adventure score. And then with this, you have the horror score. You're obviously incredibly versatile. And so I can't wait to see what you do next. We're doing uh, – yeah, the next thing is uh, it's, um, it's a feature documentary about uh, – uh, a very famous uh, writer and poet, Samuel Bloom. Mm. 
um, which is funny enough, we're, we're actually, I'm writing it literally to picture, uh, even though it's a documentary, but it's, and then we're probably going to go, I think we're recording, I think we're at Abbey Road within two months or something once it's done, but it's going to be a very small kind of chamber group for that one. Uh -huh. So one step at a time, let's see.